Well, this morning, I want to read uh, some scripture with you. First of all, I want to read an Old Testament passage, and this comes from the book of uh, Jeremiah, chapter 28, and verses 5 to 9. I feel like I need to give you just a little bit of background here. We have uh, Jeremiah responding to another so-called prophet by the name of Hananiah. And Hananiah has been telling people that everything's going to be okay. Don't you worry about what Jeremiah has been telling you. The king of Babylon is not going to come and uh, destroy our nation. Uh, it's all sweetness and light. And uh, Jeremiah, it says, replied to the prophet Hananiah before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to the place from Babylon. In other words, I would love for this to be true. That's what I would like too, Hananiah. Nevertheless, listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. In other words, the fulfillment of the prophecy is the indication that the prophecy came from God, the Lord. If it does not come true, then it's somebody's imagination, and it's false. The Bible puts a tremendous amount of emphasis on truth. That's a value that we hold and that we do not compromise on. So that is background. As we heard the psalm today, it struck me, both in last week's psalm, Psalm 91, and in this week's Psalm 119, that trouble is temporary, but truth is eternal. And now I want to go to the New Testament, and I want to read with you from Romans. I'm going to pick it up in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, and then we're going to read on through to chapter 7, verse 13. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember that verse, it's a key. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies... She is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to one another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now... By dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, 
In order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Well, that's a challenging passage, and there's a lot of stuff in there, but one thing that comes through very clearly to me is that sin is a big deal. It matters to God, and it ought to matter to us. Thank God for his spirit. He gives us his spirit to guide us, to help us, to make us the people that he created us to be. And thank God that he forgives us through the death, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let's uh, move into the message that I have to share with you this morning. I gave it kind of a weird name, I guess. It's called Uncommon Sense for Uncommon Living. We... Uh, we frequently bemoan the lack of common sense that some people seem to show. Sometimes those people are us. We wish that our children would use common sense. And uh, when I watch the television news, I can't help but wish that some of our government leaders would use more common sense and stop acting like children. But you know, common sense is not enough. We also need what I've called an uncommon sense if we want to live uncommon lives. A spiritual sensitivity that transcends common sense. A spiritual awareness that can only come from God. So today I want to talk about some truths that don't make sense unless you have a spiritual understanding that only God can give you. I have uh, three pairs of words that I want to discuss with you this morning. The first pair of words is wages or gift. Wages or gift. Wages are something that you work for, right? You want to get your salary, your wage, your pay, so you get up in the morning, perhaps earlier than you would have wished, and you... Uh, brush your teeth and pull on your clothes and you go to the office or to the farmyard or to wherever it is that you do your work. Wages are something that you work for. Wages are something that you earn. Wages are something that you deserve if you give it your all, right? But a gift, a gift is different. A gift is something that you didn't work for. A gift is something that you didn't earn. A gift is something that you didn't deserve. A gift is something that you receive, not because you're so great, but because the giver is great. It does not say much about your goodness. It says everything about the goodness of the giver. And so I find Romans 6.23 to be a very, very interesting verse because it says to us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death. We've all sinned. Therefore, we've all earned our wages. Death. That's not a very pretty picture, but that's what we've earned. That's what we deserve. Fortunately, there is an alternative. We can receive the gift of God's grace. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. Now, common sense would tell you that eternal life, if there really is such a thing, is something that you really have to strive and work for. I mean... That's the way a lot of people think. They somehow imagine a celestial balance. And all the, the bad stuff that you've done goes in over on this side. And all the good stuff that you've done goes in over on this side. And, and they imagine that, you know, as long as they can do a little more over here than what they did over here, that this will cancel out this and everything's going to be hunky-dory. I'll just move right on into heaven. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. And that 
has to be dealt with. And it can only be dealt with through a gift of God. Every other religion other than the Christian faith will tell you that you somehow have to do something in order to earn or deserve eternal life. Now here's the problem, one of the problems. All of that good stuff that you thought you were doing doesn't count for much. The Bible says that all our self-righteousness is only so much filthy rags. Oh man, how many filthy rags does it take to cancel out all the bad stuff you've done? Filthy rags aren't going to do the job. You can't get cleaned up using filthy rags. That's a problem. Some people say they can be saved by merit. Do you believe that we can be saved by merit? I do, but not by our own merit. Only by the merit of the sinless one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus died on that cross. He shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. The price was paid. Wow. The Bible uses the term justified. Just as if I'd never sinned in the first place. So, that's where I wanted to start today. I wanted to make it really clear to you that when I move into the next section of this message, I am not telling you that there's anything that you can do to earn or deserve God's salvation, his gift of eternal life. The next pair of things, the next pair of words that I want to discuss are the words faith and works. Martin Luther, the famous reformer, came up with a Latin phrase, sola fide, by which he meant faith alone. He emphasized a truth that had been lost. He emphasized, when he realized it personally, that God's free gift is received by faith and not by any works that we perform on our own. I want to take you to a passage of scripture that I think explains this so very, very clearly. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. And this is what it says. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, what is the gift of God? Is it the grace? Is it the salvation? Or is it the faith? The answer is yes. All of the above are a gift from God. It is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Not by works. You can't brag about how you earned God's salvation and gift of eternal life. That's not anything you can brag about, because it goes to his credit and not to yours that you receive it. But too often we stop at the end of verse 9, as it were. And verse 10 adds another truth that really helps us to understand more completely the whole picture. It goes right on to say, for we are God's handiwork. That can also be translated as God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. Isn't that cool? We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We can't be saved by good works, but having been saved, we are called and assigned to do good works. In fact, God has already prepared in advance good works for us to do. He wants you to put your faith into action. Now, don't misunderstand me. You can no more stay saved by your works than you could become saved by works in the first place. The works are not to get saved. The works are not to stay saved. The works are to express the salvation which you have received as a free gift from God. Now, sometimes we use some terminology that is a little bit unfortunate, I think. We tell people, all you have to do is accept Jesus as your Savior. 
I've said that myself in the past, I'm sure. But I find it a bit misleading because it gives people the idea that once I say yes to Jesus and receive forgiveness for my sin, I'm on easy street. From here on out, it's just a slide into the glory. You know, I'm going to coast right on into heaven. I don't need to worry about a thing. There's nothing more I should do. Well, it's not just a fire insurance policy. Sometimes uh, it almost sounds as if we're doing Jesus a favor. You know, let him come into your life. Accept him. When you receive God's gift of salvation, when Christ comes into your life, understand that he's not just your savior. He is your Lord and he is your master. And it rem remains our responsibility to submit to him in everything, to follow him in obedience. You cannot claim Jesus as savior if you do not follow him as Lord and master of your life. So, we are now saved in order to do good works. The Bible says, let your light so shine before other people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I'm going to take you now over to the little letter that James wrote. And he has some things to say about this that I think are well worth noting. In James chapter 2 and verse 17, we find him saying, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Wow. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. How do you tell if you have a living faith? By the action that your faith inspires. James says that the only way to show that you have faith is by your deeds, by your actions. And the Bible says that faith without deeds is useless. And then it gives examples of people who showed their faith by their actions. It gives the example of Abraham. Abraham was a great man of faith, a man who walked with God so closely that in fact it's the only person in the Bible of whom it is said that he was a friend of of God. Now it does say in general, Jesus speaking, you are my friends. But Abraham is the only one who is actually called by name the friend of God. So you say, wow. Now there's an example of a man who lived a righteous life for the most part. He is something, you know, I mean, I could never attain to that. Well, what, the, what do we learn from the next example? I find it very interesting. The very next example that James gives is Rahab the prostitute. Now, she had a lot that needed to be forgiven, but she, by an act of faith, hid the spies, the Israelite spies who had come to Jericho, and because of her faith action, it says, she was saved. James 2.26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. What some people call their faith is nothing more than traditionalism. Now, I'm not against tradition. In fact, I have a great respect for tradition. But traditionalism in the place of faith is dead. As I heard one of my pastor heroes say, Walter Winger, tradition is the living faith of dead people. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living people. So, Let's move along to the third pair of words that we want to examine today, or actually phrases in this case. I want to talk about earthly treasure or heavenly treasure, all right? I uh, brought some money to church this morning. You say, what's uh, such a big deal about that? We all brought some money to church this morning. We call it our offering or our tithe, but this is, this is a little different. I got, I got a couple of bills here. Um, wow, look at this. This one's a 20. This one's a 50. I mean, they gotta be worth something, right? Um, actually, 
These bills have no value here. Uh, these are uh, these are a couple of bills that I brought back from Uruguay when my wife and I were on a motorcycle ride down in South America a few years ago. Um, they're not good for anything here except as souvenirs. They have no value in this nation. No value here. If I walk into a store and hand them this, it's not going to cut it. When you travel in other countries, you have to convert your currency. What if you were going to relocate to another place permanently, never to return? If you knew that your native currency had no value in the place to which you were going, what would you do? I expect that if you knew that you couldn't take any of it with you, because it would be worthless where you were going, that you would do all that you could to convert as much as possible ahead of time, right? So that you had something of value when you got to the place to which you were going to be moving. If you couldn't take anything with you from the land of your birth to your new home, I believe you would do all you could to convert the currency that you had now, because later would be too late. Well, the fact is that every one of us is going on just such a journey. One day, every one of us is going to move from this land of our birth into a new realm. And that is why it is absolutely essential that we make the currency conversion now. I want to uh, read you some words that Jesus spoke. This is uh, from Matthew and uh, chapter 6. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Picking it up in verse 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Earthly treasure or heavenly treasure? Now, to say that you're laying up treasure in heaven doesn't make any sense to those who do not have a relationship with God that is real and personal. Unless you have that relationship with God, you're not going where that currency is going to be of value. I think of the quotation from Jim Elliot, a missionary martyr, who prior to his death wrote, he is no fool who loses what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Somebody put it this way, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Now understand that there's always a reward associated with doing the right thing. There's always a reward associated with doing the right thing. Now some people will say, don't talk about rewards. We shouldn't do the right thing because there's a reward to be offered. But you know, Jesus didn't hesitate to talk about rewards. He talked about rewards quite a bit. And in fact, he said that if you even do so much as give a cup of water to a child, that is an, an act that will be rewarded. However, you kind of get to choose your reward. What do I mean by that? You can choose a reward now in this world, or you can choose to have one on the deferred payment plan if you will. I read about a study that was done with children. They took a, a young child, very young child, and put them in a room and uh, placed a cookie in front of them. And they said, now, you can eat that cookie right now, if you wish. That's your cookie. But if you will wait for 20 minutes to eat that cookie, you can also have a second cookie. And then they left the child alone in the room with the cookie. 
if you think 20 minutes is not a long time, you have never been a kid with a cookie alone in a room. And some of the kids couldn't wait. They ate the cookie. Some of the kids were able to hold on for 20 minutes and not only ate that cookie, but got a second cookie as well. But what did Jesus have to say about deferred rewards? He said that if you pray, if you fast, if you give only to be seen by other people, then the praise that you get from those other people, the admiration that they extend to you, that's the only reward you're going to get. You've already got your reward. But, he says, if you do that in secret or without being seen, directly in the presence of your Father in heaven, your Father, who sees what you have done, will reward you openly. The reward doesn't always come in this life. In fact, most times it comes in the life to come. Now, don't get me wrong at this point. I'm not saying that it's wrong to be seen praying or to be seen giving. But I am saying that it is wrong to pray or give in order to be seen. You see the difference, right? In God's kingdom, earthly money and possessions have no value. Think about how hard people work to acquire money and the things it can buy in this world. You can't take it with you when you go. I heard about a fellow who was driving a Brinks armored truck and uh, he was on a bit of a schedule and he was moving along pretty quick and he came up behind some cars that were going slowly so he started passing them one after the other. And all of a sudden, he found himself behind a hearse, and he realized that he had been butting in on a funeral procession. So he was, he was pretty embarrassed, and he backed it down, and he went along at the speed of the hearse. And a car coming in the other direction saw the hearse and saw the Brinks truck behind it and said, hey, look, there's somebody who is taking it with him. But it doesn't work that way, does it? You can't take it with you. Somebody said you can't take it with you because it's gone before you are. But... Uh, you can't take it with you because it has absolutely no value where you're going. Think about it this way. Whatever you hold on to here, you ultimately lose. It's only what you give that is credited to your heavenly treasure account. How do you lay up heavenly treasure? How do you do that? You do that by using everything that you have in this world for the purposes of God's kingdom. None of us knows exactly how much time we have left in this world before we depart. But of this you can be sure, you are going to die one day. It may be soon, it may be longer, but you and I are going to die. And then, what happens? If you are God's child, you move directly into the presence of God. Wow, that will be something. Sharon, I'm, a, I'm aware that it was just a year, just over a year now, yesterday, um, that Alan left us to go and, and to be with Jesus. Uh, it brings tears to my eyes, but I don't cry for him. I cry sometimes for Sharon and for friends who he left behind, for family. But I know that he has moved into a realm where he will receive his reward. We don't know how much time we have. Therefore, make the most of the time that you have to convert as much as possible to heavenly currency before it is too late. Your time, your talents, your wealth, your possessions, your love, use it all for the purposes of God's kingdom. And that's an investment that always, always 
is guaranteed to pay off. Let's pray. Father God, we've tackled some big topics today, and I know there's a lot more than what I've been able to explain in these few moments. But we want to thank you, God, for the reality of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And thank you that we can use earthly money, possessions, time, and talent, love, to lay up treasures in heaven. First of all, God, I want to pray that if there's anybody here who's never made a commitment of their life to Jesus Christ, that today they would submit, confess their sin, receive your forgiveness, and begin their new life as children of God, children destined for the kingdom. And then, God, I pray that for those who have a relationship with you that is real and personal, that we would do all that we can to express our faith through our actions and to lay up treasures in heaven, as Jesus told us to do. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior.